Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dean Lane, and I am the Senior Vice President for Cyber Intelligence here at the Institute of Politics. And um, for those of you that are new, have never been here, and I don't know how many of you have or haven't been here, but IWP, Institute of World Politics, is a graduate school, okay? We don't, we don't award undergraduate degrees, only graduate degrees. Um, of national security and international affairs. Okay? And there are five master degree programs that are offered. And there are also 18 certificate programs. So that's kind of a little bit about IWP. Today's speaker is Lieutenant Commander Joseph Hatfield. Um, and he is currently serving as a professor at the Department of Cyber um, Science at the U.S. Naval Academy. Just up the road a little bit. Uh, and he teaches courses on uh, the technical fundamentals of cybersecurity, the ethics, policies, and um, policies of cyber operation, um, and intelligence and national security. And, uh, he's an active duty naval intelligence officer uh, which means he's been been, to the, been through the training in the school. And he's got over 10 years of experience, over a decade of operational experience, uh, including combat tours, okay, aboard the USS uh, Eisenhower. Okay. Um, he's also served in England and Sicily, and they let him come back into the country. And he earned his PhD at Cambridge University, and he's he's published both um, scholarly papers and chapters of books, and so he's well read and well spoken. And um, please welcome Joe Hatfield. All right, as people trickle in, that's fine. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I think it was Oscar Wilde who once said that uh, I think nothing boasts like modesty, but at the risk of sounding modest, uh, I don't know that I deserve all of that, but thank you very much. Um, so what I want to talk about today is social engineering and cybersecurity. And one of the areas that I do research in and, and one of the areas that I like to talk to students as well as practitioners about is the way in which human beings can be manipulated in order to get access to those um, sensitive systems and networks that very often um, uh, you know, has, that, has the, the, uh, the data in it that we really want. right? And very often if you have a network that has great encryption, they're, 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 they're using good technology, hashing, salting of passwords, if they've got good firewalls, if they're patching their systems to rev, etc. What you find in the field is that in that type of environment, getting access to the data that you need as a hacker, as, a, as an information operator, uh, is actually kind of, can be kind of difficult. Right? And in that environment, the weakest link is actually the human operator. Right? So hacking the human being is sometimes used as a shorthand for this idea of social engineering. So um, but what, what I've done is I've, I've written a paper, uh, and I'm sort of going to kind of go through some of the concepts of the paper, and I welcome questions at the end, which is fine. I'm happy to take questions uh, not only about uh, what I talk about here, but also some of our initiatives at the Naval Academy, if anybody's interested. Um, and so let's get started. So this is going to be called Social Engineering and Cybersecurity, the Evolution of a Concept. Now, what I'm not going to do is stand up here and tell you how to socially engineer people. And I'm not going to tell you, uh, we're not going to go on and on about case studies of social engineering, although I will mention some. I'm going to do something different today. Uh, what I am interested in is the history of the concept of social engineering itself. And my, my first thought into this was, well, let's go to the source for the history of any concept, which is the Oxford English Dictionary. Right? So, let's see if I can. When, I, when you go to the OED, which of course is the dictionary that 
you know, traces the history of every term and its use and so on. What you'll find is, interestingly enough, or at least it caught my interest, you'll find two different definitions of the term social engineering. The first one has a strictly political context or a social public policy context. I don't know if you can see this, but the first one, definition number one, the use of centralized planning in an attempt to manage social change and regulate the future development and behavior of a society. Then there is a second definition, which has to do with cybersecurity, cyber operations, the cyber realm, right? We can, we can uh, quibble over definitions later. But this was chiefly in computing, the use of deception in order to induce a person to divulge private information or especially unwittingly provide unauthorized access to a system or a network. So the idea is that you've got two separate definitions, and, and I'll just get a show of hands. Who here thinks that those two sound very different? Yeah, and it, they, they look very different to me. What I'm going to argue in this paper is that these are actually fundamentally the same thing, okay? And that it has been mutual ignorance on the part of different communities doing these things that have and some characteristics of how social engineering goes about in both realms uh, that has eluded us so far, or that has um, caused us not to see this the, the, the similarities. Okay? Uh, so it's a little bit provocative, but we'll, we'll see how this goes. Okay? So um, let me begin by talking about its first use. So the very first time it was used, uh, as you can see in the OED, I love the OED, I could read it all day, right? was uh, an econ a British economist, a socialist economist named John Gray, who in 1842, right? so if my thesis is that both of these definitions are actually fundamentally the same thing, then I want to begin at the beginning. So in 1842, why did John Gray, this socialist um, economist, why did he first put the word social engineering together? Well, let's take a look. So I have here, uh, in a, a book of his, entitled, An Efficient Remedy for the Distress of Nations. Uh, John Gray, essentially, um, he likened the pol uh, political and social engineers of the day, who believed that they knew how to fix society's ills, to a group of mechanical engineers. And so I'd like to read you his, his this is in chapter 7, he says, well, he begins by saying, there could hardly be any more conclusive evidence of the general ignorance which pervades society respecting the causes of human troubles than the great, than the great diversity of opinion that exists on the subject. Right? So there's this, one of the, the main cause of our inability to get things done in a social policy standpoint is the fact that we all disagree on what is to be done to fix it, even if we agree on what the goal is. And then on page 117 of his book, he says the following. This is the first time this ever happened. First time he, anybody uses it. He says, if a steam engine were to go wrong so that it would not perform its work, and if a number of engineers were sent for separately to examine it and to report upon its faults, the chances are that all of them would ascribe the non-working of the machine to the same cause. And that the true one because every engineer would be presumed to understand the nature and construction of the things submitted to him. Its defects, whatever they might be, would, would be at once apparent. I wonder what degree of similitude would exist between the reports, and you can almost sense the sarcasm here, uh, the reports of a number of committees appointed to sit in judgments for six months upon the question of commercial difficulty, its causes and remedy. Alas, how various and contradictory are the reports of the political and social engineers of the present day. That's the very first use of the term social engineer. And he's referring, it's, an, it's a metaphor. Right? He's using a metaphor to engineers working on a steam engine. And he's trying to say, people who are trying to manipulate society in various ways, they're like engineers. Except that unlike the engineer, they can't agree upon what to do, which is why we end up running afoul of all kinds of social, economic, and other types of policy. So that's the very first use. Um, so here's John Gray's steam engine. He himself was actually uh, in the printing business for a while. So when you 
probably you would have thought of maybe a, a railroad steam engine, but he was probably thinking of steam driving his printing press. But the point was is that if this thing breaks down, you get five different people who know about these things. They would come in. They'd all diagnose the same thing. They would converge upon the right answer because there's some sort of objective reality that's constraining the choices. You can't just make things up. Unfortunately, with respect to social engineering from on the in the uh, political sense, he, he felt like they would have a, a harder go at that. Okay, now fast forwarding just a little bit. In 1891, gentlemen to the far left, probably you may have seen him, very famous uh, Norwegian econ American economist, uh, Thorsten Veblen, who in a in an essay entitled "Some Neglected Points in the Theory of Socialism." He imagines whether a modern economy's industrial structure uh, could be refashioned along the lines envisioned by socialist economists of his own day. Right? So, just a little bit ago, people like John Gray. Uh, Veblen remarked that uh, this possibility was a, a practical question of, quote, constructive social engineering rather than an inherently logical or theoretical consideration. Second use. Just a little bit later, 1914, Jane Addams, the great American social worker who you see in the middle, uh, also a women's suffragette, activist, social reformer, etc. She applied the term social engineering in the exact same sense to European government's attempts to adopt policies of social insurance and labor exchanges in the effort to combat unemployment. Like Gray and Veblen, Adams emphasized the relationship between knowledge and policy efficaciousness, noting that women ought to be consulted before embarking on bouts of public policy aimed at reorganizing large swaths of the labor market. Saying also, and this is quite humorous, since, uh, since in many parts of that market, men were simply unaware of the necessary details. And she provides a wonderful example. She provides an example of a British parliamentary debate, an all-male debate, of course, at her time, over whether it, whether it should be made illegal to manufacture children's sleepwear out of a supposedly flammable material, which, Adam sardonically remarks, any woman of the day could have told them it didn't exist. <laughs> so, the idea is let's bring women into it. But she used that same phrase, social engineering. The gentleman to the far right, Joseph Smith, uh, who was, uh, in 1937, he was at the Stanford University Food Research Institute, uh, advocated for, quote, social engineering to become a new academic discipline on the grounds that applied social science scientists were able to harness social, uh, social ties using the growing quantities of statistical data and with it the application of cutting-edge social scientific techniques. Um, probably a little over-optimistic, but still, he, that was the fundamental concept that he had. Davis wrote, quote, I see indications of cravings for the services of real social engineers who will not only plan and execute, but bring constructive plans to success, successful execution, and of social doctors who will not only prescribe and treat, but really cure social ills. This reminds me of John Maynard Keynes' famous analogy. That uh, that economists should be if, if he's actually he was he was actually looking for if aspiring to be think thought of as a dentist he said uh, if if uh, in the general theory I believe it is he says if economists could get themselves to be thought of as dentists you know careful people who have a job to do they go in they do it and then they go along he said that would be splendid uh, same same kind of idea uh, and roughly same time period actually so okay. Um, also during this period, and the only reason why I don't have her up here is because I could not, could not find a photograph of her, but um, Margaret Reed, not Margaret Mead, but Margaret Reed, uh, who as an ethnographer began employing the term to describe relative power relations between conqueror and conquered tribes in Africa. For example, in 1938, she used social engineering to describe the manner in which the conquering Ngoni people of now, now Malawi subjugated and then enforced their moral codes upon the con their conquered neighbors. Reed, Margaret Reed, observed that this social engineering involved a considerable amount of nation building, planning, and modification of the social, social institutions over which the Ngoni now ruled. Since moral codes themselves are interwoven uh, with 
a people's story about national identity and overall sense of purpose. Uh, these had to be replaced by the identities and the purposes of the Nagoni. In turn, European conquerors had also replaced the social structures of the Nagoni with structures designed to fulfill European purposes, the extraction of labor and resources. Right? Um, so she also used this term social engineering. So the Nagoni socially engineered their environment and then the uh, the European colonialists came in and socially engineered this again. Again, this is where the term is, is uh, becoming usable. Okay, now, um, one thing that's common amongst all of these uses of the term social engineering is the notion of a relative measurement of knowledge. In each and every case, the person that's doing the social engineering has more knowledge than the target. Right? They, they know how to do something that the target does not. And that gives them a certain amount of power. Um, it's a relative knowledge, not an absolute knowledge uh, relationship. Why is it not absolute? After all, the success of building bri a bridge uh, rests on the engineer's absolute knowledge of br bridge building. How the materials will pull and stretch under the hot and cold conditions, even as bridge building involves the coordination of sometimes many hundreds of people. Unlike bridges, however, social engineering by public policy planners requires that the engineer pulls and stretches the behavior of individuals themselves. Through the process, through, uh, through processes that become less effective if those individuals affected by the plan become cognizant of the engineer's motives. Like a magician's illusion, once the sleight of hand has been spotted, its entertainment value becomes stale. Economists have long understood this phenomenon, and there's even a whole school of thought called rational expectations, which tries to show that uh, you know, a tax cut is instantly, as a stimulus policy, like a Keynesian tax cut, is instantly uh, negated by changes in behavior, which renders the push in aggregate demand moot. We can debate that point later. But the point is, is that this is a relative measurement. Okay. I want to talk about three principles so far in this notion of, of social engineering. The first principle is what I call epistemic asymmetry. Now that's a fancy word. Epistemic is just comes from the Greek word for knowledge. Okay? There's a knowledge asymmetry between the person who's doing the social engineering. In this case, we're still in the political context, right? We haven't got to the present day. But someone who's using that knowledge as a way to enact a policy that maybe the individuals themselves, who are the people affected by this, would not have behaved in that particular way, but now they are, whether it be economic or political or whatever. So epistemic asymmetry occurs when one person or group enjoys a significant advantage of knowledge over another person with, or, or group within a specific domain. So I have here, again, sort of an ideal Keynesian policy showing that, you know, during times of slump you would stimulate ag aggregate demand and then you would uh, go into debt for that. And then, of course, this other side never happens. But in times of plenty, you would, of course, raise taxes and get that money back. But that latter half never seems to work. So <laughs> you're supposed to balance the budget over the business cycle and all of that. But, uh, okay, anyways, so that's, <laughs> that's Keynesianism, right? Or part of it. Um, okay. Um, now, the second, the second principle, which is very closely related, and there's Mr. Keynes down there to the, to the right, is what I call technocratic dominance. Technocratic dominance occurs when a person or group possessing a high degree of technical knowledge, whether it be statistical knowledge needed for national income accounting in an economic standpoint, or uh, as we will see later with uh, cyber, some particular technological, um, some, some information that allows you access to that network. Uh, but a high degree of technical knowledge that, that uses that knowledge to enact changes in the behaviors of others, okay, where such behaviors place those affected in a position of decreased power uh, or authority relative to the former inside that affected domain, right? It doesn't, it's not carte blanche across their whole life, it's just within that affected domain. So that that epistemic asymmetry lends a certain amount of power, which if it is translated into technocratic means, it becomes a, a way in which you can have authority over others. Now, principle number three is a repurposing. Sorry, my words seem really fancy, but teleological replacement. Teleology is just the Greek word for purpose. 
or end or goal. Okay, So you are replacing the goals and purposes of the behavior of the target, the people being social engineered, with those of the individual who is doing the social engineering. Right? I, I don't want to spend, I want to save. No, you're going to be getting a tax cut that is going to put you in a particular state of mind that is going to allow, or it's going to not force you, but it's going to predispose you to spending. Okay? Uh, tax credit, let's say. So teleological replacement occurs when a person or a group manages to substitute in their target, in the individual group that is their target, the original purpose or goal of their behavior with that of the social engineer. Again, we're still in the political realm here, but um, now I have at the bottom a uh, what's called the, the triangular trade, because I'm still thinking in terms, of, and this is very much like Margaret Reed's comment about how the colonial, well, first local economies and then, and then later the, the um, uh, European colonialists would go and, and alter the structure of the economies in faraway lands, rip apart their normal means of production and their ways of uh, relating to each other, and reorganize that society purely for the focus of extraction of resources, which was the purpose, there's a repurposing of that society for the British Empire or for whomever, right? Um, my stepdad's English, so I feel like I can pick on that. So. Uh, okay, so that's teleological replacements. These are three principles. Three principles. Now, we sort of stopped off with Margaret Reed in, in around the 1930s. Um, uh, let's see, where am I? Yeah, so it might be said that social engineering, as it applied to politics and public policy, had really come of age by the late 60s. You see here, these are, it branched off after that. You start to see it kind of come on. Within a, within a few decades, it goes from being a metaphor that was uh, introduced as a way to try to illustrate a point in an, in an economics book. And then it becomes branched off into all of these uses. Things like political philosophy, anthropology of race, agriculture policy, analysis of the workplace. But if you look over this list, this is still at least partially in the economic realm or the public policy, social, analyzing society. Okay? But it's really kind of come, comes of age so that you, you would see it in the lexicon of many people, educated people at that time. Um, so a term that began in an analogy to steam engines in 1845 had, by 1970, become part of the everyday lexicon of researchers and commentators working in over a dozen fields across academia. Okay, so there's, there we are. Now, you might take a look at these dates and go, aren't we getting close to the computer, this whole computer thing? And yes, and that's where we, we're going to see the, 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 the jump over into to computers. Uh, let's see. Oh, I guess I should say. It then uh, we'll, we'll we'll get back to the to the uh, the sixties and the seventies, but I'll just show you where it went. It it then branched out way beyond. I mean, to, even today you can hear you can hear people talk about social engineering in this in this first definition. Remember the Oxford English Dictionary, the first definition. It's now everything that children's literature in nineteen ninety five, right? How we can educate and moralize our children through I don't know what books they read and so on, right? Um, aesthetics, legal thought, marketing, post-colonial politics, military socialization, and so on. So you see it, it really starts to branch out. And nowadays it wouldn't surprise me, you know, if I saw a you know, Budweiser commercial with the term social engineering, I don't know. Actually, maybe that would surprise me, but I don't know. Uh, but it's really branched out quite a bit. Okay, now, in the 60s and 70s, now we're going to jump into the 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 cyber realm, or at least the precursor to the cyber realm. Again, we can we can uh, debate over um, nomenclature if we if we want to. But um, so, but let me set the stage for what what we're going to call the phone free. What is called the phone freaking phenomenon. So, compu computational devices have been in existence, if not in practical use, since the days of Charles Babbage. Charles Babbage. Everybody thinks Turing created you know computers. Uh, not so much. It was it was a Cambridge mathematician. But that's about a hundred years too late, right? Charles Babbage was a was a uh, I think he actually held the Lucasian chair of mathematics. Uh, but anyways, he he was a Cambridge mathematician who also uh, dabbled in computational devices and so on. And basically, he was sick and tired of running up sums down. You know, at that time, the word computer meant someone who computes, just like runner means someone who runs. 
and you would have tables of numbers, and two people would sum them up, and then you'd do a check sum, right? You'd, you would check your sum to make sure that, and, and it's a tedious process, and you, if you have a mistake, it's hard to go back and figure out where. And so he, at one point, said in his diary, he said, um, I wish, actually, I think he lamented this to someone else. He said, I wish this could be just be done by steam. I wish we could just have these calculations done. So he set about himself to build this thing, and he ended up building a couple different types of machines, and government money cut off, so he never really got it fully built, but they've subsequently rebuilt it, and you can see it in London. Uh, but it's called the difference engine, and it was essentially a mechanical device that you had to turn a crank on, but it would you would set up uh, the, the, the initial conditions, and it would do all kinds of arithmetical functions. Addition, subtraction, exponents, logarithms, etc. It's pretty, it's quite ingenious. If you're ever in London, uh, go to the Cyber Museum. Uh, it's right by the British Museum, and it's wonderful. It's, it's really. Uh, anyway, so ever since Babbage uh, is around, uh, there are computational devices um, of in ever increasing complexity. The term cyber age today uh, connotes more than just computational devices, but the public use of such devices within a context in which they are connected to each other to form a network. Network computing brings with it immediate security considerations that standalone computational devices really don't. Um, as such, the cyber age arguably began in the 1960s and early 70s, arguably, um, with the advent of uh, the ARPANET, which is the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. Uh, social engineering, as we understand it today, within its cybersecurity context, began with the phone freaking phenomenon. Okay? And I'll talk about what phone freaking is in just a second. Um, in the late 50s, all the way through the 70s. But the term actually jumped over in the, in in the mid-1970s. And I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, which, which uh, uh, okay. So, uh, following the success of the Manhattan Project, a profusion of military defense-related funds rushed into public and private institutions conducting research in, at that time, was called cybernetics, right? Which is a term that came from a, from a uh, kind of science fiction book. The cybernetics movement brought with it a growing optimism in the success of policy-related social engineering. Human minds that were, were then understood as Turing machines, right? That they could execute any computable function. Um, and... Uh, with two robotic feedback mechanisms that gave them the ability to play games, which then lended itself to game theoretic analyses of human cognition. At that, within that context, within that sort of 70s philosophy of mind, as we would, would say, uh, social engineering is really just a matter of designing the game to get the right output. Okay? Uh, the desired human response would be the product of the initial conditions of the game. Um, this optimism extended far beyond public policy planning and into areas such as business, as evidenced by Robert McNamara's WizKid scientific management group at Ford Motor Company, and even in spirituality with science fiction author and cybernetics enthusiast L. Ron Hubbard's Introduction of Scientology. So it really spread all over the place. So you can't have a good talk without mentioning Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard. No offense to anybody. Okay. Uh, so... Um, so really, it was into that milieu that this uh, that social engineering underwent a trans, trans uh, a transformation in application, even as its core elements remain static. Okay, um, this occurred within the phone freaking subculture. Um, phone freakers used their growing technical knowledge of the way phone systems operated, their circuits, switches, relays, their tonal complexities and network diagrams to essentially hijack the telephone system for their own purposes, whether to avoid fees, uh, connect with foreign phone calls, right? And if some of us are, even, even me, I, I love the age where it's like, when I was a kid growing up in Kansas, like we just didn't make long distance calls. Like that was too expensive. Other people get to do that, not us, right? <laughs> <laughs> this was usually in the same conversation of, can I have such and such a, no, I'm sorry, we don't have any money. Uh, but we don't make long-distance calls, and yeah, so. Uh, or uh, or that just to gain access to areas of network, the network considered off-limits by normal telephonic protocols. So, um, does anyone happen to know who the gentleman is on the top right? Okay, just one, yeah. Captain Crunch. 
Captain Crunch. Oh, I'm sorry. But he found that whistle in the, in the cereal box. Thank you. Sorry. That's the frequency. The interesting guy's down here on the right there. Yes. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. So, so this, he's actually, uh, uh, John uh, Draper, Captain Crunch is his call sign, uh, is over here on the right. He's at the phone at the phone booth, right? And I don't know who the two friends are, but this is uh, an early picture of him. There's him, a little more contemporary. Uh, and I'm trying to get him to come to the Naval Academy, and he wants to come to the Naval Academy. We'll see if we can get him to. Uh, but, I've, but part of the research is me extensively discussing this with John Draper, because it's John Draper who first introduced the term social engineering into the cyber realm. It is John Draper. I tracked it down. It is him. Um, he claims to have no knowledge of all this political mumbo jumbo that I was talking to him about. He's like, I don't know what social policy analysis is. I don't know anything about Keynesian economics. I just thought it was like engineering a telephone. And essentially, he independently did what John Gray did way back in the day. Right? He independently said, no, I just thought it was a good metaphor to use. And so I started using it within my phone freaker culture, which then transformed into hacker culture. So why we call, uh, you know, why Christopher Hagnaggy can write a book on social engineering, the art of human hacking, is because John Draper originally used that term. Okay? Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about phone freaking. Um, so Draper had a friend named Denny Teresi, who was blind, who is blind. Uh, and he just so happened to have perfect pitch in his voice. He could do perfect pitches. And it just so happens that Denny Den Teresi had figured out that if you make the 2600 hertz pitch into a payphone or any phone, it accesses, at that time, the Ma Bell's like, uh, operator line, the operator system, right? So that you are no longer in the normal, you're like the sysadmin now, right? <laughs> And, you, and so you wouldn't get, if you called a, uh, if you called someone else, you would have privileges, so to speak. I'm trying to use this in our normal. You would have said, he basically pivoted into what we would think of as root access or on a Unix system or, or, or administrator rights on a Windows operating system, right? He did it. So he, and, and, uh, and so, so he, he, as a friend, uh, Denny Teresi would do this all the time, just as fun, right? And once they did that, they would start to man try to figure out more about the network, right? They would say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on, hey, I'm, I'm uh, Bill, I'm working on trunk number five. I just need to know the number two, trunk number six. Oh, yeah, that's such and such. And they, they would start mapping the network. They would in-map. They would, they would run, they, they would investigate their surroundings once they're in and slowly pivot and ele elevate their privileges. Um, I'm, I'm trying to use kind of hacker terms or computer science terms, but it's essentially the same behavior. Um, and, and I, well, okay, we'll get to that. Down here on the bottom right, you might know who those, those people are. I don't have that name on them. Wozniak? Yeah, Wozniak's on the far right, Mitnick. and Mitnick's in the middle. Very good. Thank you. I, I just use that to test and see if... Free Kevin. Uh, free Kevin. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> that's right. <laughs> Wear a t-shirt. So these are very, very famous people in computer science. Steve Wozniak, of course. But Kevin Mitnick is, most people would say, the the premier social engineer. Not so much a technical guy as much as he was a uh, con artist, ability to manipulate his way into things and so on. I will say this, when, uh, uh, well, I wasn't there, and so I do see a film camera here, so I want to be a little bit, but uh, I was told that when uh, Kevin Mitnick came to the Naval Academy, one of the things he asked was for a, uh, an, uh, a he wanted an account on our system, like an email account and everything. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> sorry, you are too good. <laughs> so, um, so we, I don't, I don't believe he has an email account or any kind of. Uh, we'll see. I don't. Um, but yeah, so that that is essentially the '60s and '70s phone freaking phenomenon is when the term social engineering leapt over, or essentially got rediscovered by John Draper, by Captain Crunch. So here's here's Captain Crunch. Now, why why is he called Captain Crunch? He's called Captain Crunch because he couldn't do his friend could do perfect pitch. John Draper could not. But it just so happens that. They figured out that that right around that, that time period, Captain Crunch was selling a little toy whistle in the cereal. And that whistle gave a 2600 perfect pitch. So he, they would take that whistle, and now you can go on eBay and buy these things for like you know, $50, $60. I still, I should own one, but I, I just, I don't want to drop 60 bucks for a plastic <laughs> whistle. My wife would make fun of me, whatever. So um, they also learned to set up what, 
over on the left is called a, a little blue box or a blue box. And this is a essentially it's a it's you know it's a keypad that you dial and you make tones into that little speaker and they can hold it up. So once they elevated their privileges into the phone into the phone network, they could use these tones to access you know non-human requests. Social engineer the people, but then go ahead and use the tones to go ahead and pivot your way around the network. Because at that time, the phones network were by far the most sophisticated and extensive and technical technical uh, network there was. So um, so that's tools of the trade. Okay, so um, and they later got caught. Um, I don't know. Do we have the ability to to go to the internet on this computer or? Yeah. Yeah. We should. Okay. Let me see if I can. Because I've got I've got uh, John Draper in action here. And hopefully there is. Uh, what do we got? Let me just did it click. Is it already? I don't know. I to PDF this. So let's see. Yes. Let's see what happens. Yes, let's allow. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> or maybe not. You're probably, probably not connected. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, we won't worry about it. <clears throat> well, there's a great, uh, there's a great, um, where am I at? Oh. Help me out here. Where's the... Select the PDF at the bottom. Where's that? Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. I'm on the... Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let me go full screen. Okay, so there's a great um, film that you can just go on YouTube and get. It's called The Secret History of Hacking, where Draper talks about some of this. He doesn't get all the detail. I had to get it out of him through personal interview. But he talks a lot about how they develop this sort of uh, the phone freaking. His friend Denny Teresa, they even go into his house and show a lot of stuff. So I definitely recommend, uh, recommend that to you. Uh, well, then, the ba a bad thing happened in 1971, and that is that Esquire magazine caught wind of this phenomenon going on, and they ended up outing them by name. <laughs> it wasn't just Captain Crunch, it was John Captain Crunch Draper, who lives down the street, here's his address kind of thing. And so, this scared everybody and forced them underground. Okay. Um, but one of the important things that I think the writer, uh, uh, Rosenbaum, missed was the continuities that are going on here with previous uses of social engineering. So, um, so, uh, so during the 70s, the fruits of the application of social engineering was disseminated in freaker meetings, uh, characteristically in illegal conference calls, and in underground newsletters of phone freak, freaker associated subversive groups, such as the Technological American Party, which actually was investigated by the FBI. Um, you can get uh, some F, uh, Freedom of Information Act released by the FBI revealed that in these newsletters, TAP, or the Technical Technological American Party, members published phone network diagrams and how-to guides for beginning phone freakers, so you want to be a phone hacker, so to speak, alongside tips on things like how to reverse gas meters, right? And uh, that's one I saw in one of the publications. I thought that was pretty cool. And other illegal schemes. By the mid to late 70s, the Wall Street Journal, of all places, noted that phone freaking had spread beyond the technologically savvy underground to the well-heeled, including businessmen, doctors, brokers, and entertainers. So everybody can hack phones. It's cool, right? Uh, phone companies later changed things to make it much more difficult, but not impossible. Um, okay, so uh, the phone freakers, and this is kind of one of the main points I want to make had transformed the notion of social engineering through a novel application, but they did so without altering its core elements. Before phone freaking, the term social engineering had only been applied to the activities of powerful policy planners, individuals in business or governments attempting to cure what they defined as society's ills, right? Like a doctor or a dentist or something, uh, through their use of superior technical knowledge. Phone freakers inverted this uh, this. Uh, power structure. Here were relatively powerless individuals, often teenagers, right, uh, gaining epistemic asymmetry, technological dominance, and technological dominance over the powerful phone companies, which they then used for their own purposes through this process of teleological replacement. The other inversion that took place uh, under this new application was from the allegedly benign purposes of, um, of powerful policy planners to the nefarious purposes of the freakers, uh, often illegal purposes, right? 
existence. Freakers reversed the social hierarchy that had stood alongside the concept of social engineering, and at the same time, put this tactic to their own, often disrep disreputable and illegal uses. Yet the core ideas inherent in social engineering as a tactic remained perfectly intact. Questions about the, so the direction, up or down, or even across a social hierarchy, to which the tactic of social engineering is applied are exogenous to the tactic itself. Phone freakers did not so much change the meaning, but simply use a tactic of the powerful against those in power. And because of those differences, because the power isn't going top down, it's going bottom up, people miss the fact that this is the exact same phenomenon. Okay. The 19... Sorry, there's my. That's that's the most recent photo I have of him. But uh, social engineering, uh, these these are these inversions I just talked about. Nevertheless, these principles are still there. The principles are still there. Um, okay. Um, so moving up to the 80s. Again, this is the evolution of the concept, right? Um, so, well, let me set the stage here. So the 1960s and 1970s were a period of rapid technological development in computer technology, right? And alongside it, the opportunities for exploit exploiting that technology. Interactive computing, time sharing, user authentication, file sharing via hierarchical file structures and computer utility prototypes were all part of a wave of technological innovations in the 1960s. Alongside this, alongside this way, we had security tools that started coming into place, such as access controls, passwords were starting to be implemented. The next decade saw the beginnings of local area networks, uh, packet networks, uh, an object-oriented design, protected by a wave of cryptographic applications, such as public key cryptography, uh, security verification, cryptographic protocols, cryptographic hashing, that sort of thing. Um, this increased the awareness of security as a necessary feature of information systems. This, this increased awareness uh, led to the application of mathematical models of security for the first time that, for the first time, demonstrated provably secure systems. Okay? Uh, not just good ideas, but if all of these pieces are there, it cannot be broken. Right? As these, or at least not broken by, with the current technology. As these technical security measures increased in their sophistication, quote, computer hackers, who were the natural outgrowth of the phone freaker community, began to rely more and more on non-technical ways to manage via computer networks the same inversion that Teresi and Draper and others had done with phone freaking, doing with the cell phone system. In the 80s, the adoption of the TCP IP model, okay, the growth of the internet, the proliferation of, of personal computers, the client-server model for network ser uh, services effectively united the computer community and the phone freakers, particularly since the early computer networks com computed, uh, co uh, communicated over the phone lines, right? So these all, all of these are converging. In 1984, the term social engineering appeared in an anonymous article in, early, in the early Hacker Magazine 2600, the Hacker Quarterly, right? That's 1984 is when it appears, but it was actually Draper who originally introduced it. It's been, it was in the subculture, and then it appears in 2600, which drew its name from the 2600 hertz tone that freakers used. Um, this was the phone freaking equivalent to gaining admin access. I already made that point. Um, the 2600 article entitled Vital Ingredients, Switching Centers and Operators, described social engineering in terms of persuading someone to provide information, and e elsewhere simply as BSing. I won't say the whole thing. Um, in in uh, 1988, the rival now online now online magazine Frack, anybody knows Frack, very famous early, um, uh, which is a, a portmanteau of freak and hack, right? Freakers, hackers, uh, also used BSing to get information to define social engineering. Uh, this included an article's uh, title, "Social Engineering." Craig Niedorf, who was who is who was then called Night Lightning, who was a co-founder of FRAC, alongside Randy Tipsler, uh, Taran King, um, began publishing in 1985 and continues to this day. He actually replied, I, I got into contact with him, and he confirmed that the FRAC article in question was really just a collection of message board postings from a bulletin board known as Metal Shop Private, and those posts are dated from April to May 1987. 
The message boards with the bulletin board were broken up into sections, category such as hacking, freaking, anarchy, or in this case, social engineering. There was no single author of the article, but rather, rather many authors of the individual posts, etc. Um, nevertheless, the art of social engineering was, engineering was definitely in play in the hacker community by 1987. Uh, this was actually what, for a long time, I thought was the original. Because if you go to the OED, guess what date it says the computer social engineering first was arrived at? 1991. Balderdash. <laughs> Not true. I've corrected the Oxford English Dictionary. And as a Cambridge man, that gives me significant pleasure. <laughs> okay, so uh, in 1990, now I don't know actually, the OED, they might think a hacker magazine doesn't cut it in terms of publication or whatever. It probably needs to be like Oxford University Press or something, I don't know. Uh, that's just a, a slight little dig. Um, so in 1990, Niedorf, Craig Niedorf, was later arrested and charged with possession and distribution of stolen Bell South documents. Uh, he was later he was able, able later able to show that everything that he released or everything he had access to he could get for fifteen dollars and the case was essentially dismissed. But one of the government's expert uh, law uh, uh, lawyers present there at the court case was Dorothy Denny, who's very famous, and she actually remarked to me that that both the government at that time and Craig Niedorf, they were all using the term social engineering. So this is definitely in play. Even the government, even government bureaucrats are using it at this point. So very much in play. No offense to probably everyone in the room. Okay, <laughs> so, um, and myself included. Um, so by 1990, the technical terrain upon which computer hackers operated had grown in complexity even more. Uh, gather, uh, making gathering, information gathering through manipulation or impersonation or BSing to the anonymous author, authors of 2600 and FRAC are the main objective for social engineering attacks. This same complexity gave both technical hackers and those attempting to thwart their objectives room to maneuver, leading to the introduction of malicious software, viruses, worms, trojans, etc., uh, malware detection, antivirus techniques, uh, buffer overflow attacks, uh, intrusion detection, firewalls, etc. <clears throat> In such a context, in, a, in such a context, the premium on information had risen dramatically. Uh, echoing the situation early phone freakers encountered two decades earlier, when using social engineering to collect information about telephone networks, such information could be then be used to attack the networks directly without the use of human manipulation. Today, computer network security maintain, uh, maintains enough robustness and sometimes even automated vigilance that experienced hackers no longer seek to replace social engineering with uh, automated techniques or technical um, exploits, but rather view social engineering as an integral part, some even say the most important part of any successful hacker's toolkit. Indeed, some observers now refer to social engineering as the highest form of hacking. Okay, we're almost done. So there's the complexity. In 1990s, you saw, again, the malware, malware detection. You start to see sort of offense and defense that's moving up. Buffer overflow, phishing attacks, right? Especially with the advent of the internet and email becoming prevalent. Uh, I've got there on the, the far right. Does anybody know what that, that screen is? That is actually the screenshot that Mr. John Podesta saw on his computer when he ended up. And that, doesn't that look exactly like it's from Google? That would trick most people, and it did trick him. He then sent it to his IT guys, actually, and said, I mean, from the press reports I've read, and said, hey, is there somebody's got my account, whatever? They recognized this as, a, as an issue. The IT guys really did, did a good thing. But unfortunately, they said, yes, you really need to change your password, and he went back to this to change the password. <laughs> oh, no, no. Yes, and so, um, and so that's how it happened. When you have a sophisticated network that's well defended, the weakest point is the human being, right? And I, probably everybody in this room, including myself, would fall for something like that at one point in time, right? It's very difficult. Because you're playing upon parts of human nature. You know, we trust Google, for the most part. Uh, you know, and so when this happens, it looks legitimate, everything looks good. You might raise a red flag, your IT guy says, no, you, you, yeah, you need to change that. It looks like somebody's got it. And unfortunately, Mr. Podesta, clicked according to the press reports on the very same flag that had, had gotten him. So 
he was trying to do the right thing. Okay, social engineering today. And this is kind of the last bit. Social engineering today. Um, it takes a whole lot of different forms, right? We have impersonation, where you walk into a place and, hey, you know, like I came to the front desk and I said, uh, hi, my name is Joe Hatfield. They looked on the list and they said, um, oh, well, oh, and, and, and then um, I can't remember who was next to me and said, oh, actually, he's the guest speaker. And, and, the, and immediately, oh, okay, great, we're good, right? Um, and so I immediately said, maybe I just socially engineered you into getting into this room, right? You automatically trust. I've been vouched by someone you trust, therefore it's trustworthy. That's essentially what happened to the, I think, the Podesta email. Social network attacks, where you're, you're uh, for instance, a, uh, a, a civil attack. Um, there, a civil attack is where you have, back in the, I think it was the mid-80s, there was a woman, a civil something, other, I can't remember her name, but she basically convinced the entire world that she had like 100 multiple personalities inside of it. And it turns out it was a hoax. And, but she had, she had convinced clinical people with serious uh, academic credentials that there was this thing which and she would it'd be like, you know, let me talk to Linda. And she would like do this seance thing and come out and be like, hi, I'm Linda, I'm eight years old kind of thing. Um, so that's where the civil attack, the name comes from. A civil attack is when you use automated techniques to create many personas in a social network system. And you're on some subreddit, and your victim is on that subreddit, and you're trying to influence their attitudes, their views, everything. Part of what we, part of how we get an understanding of what is okay, what is normal, what is uh, the bounds of reasonable debate, what are the bounds of reasonable opinion, is simply by who else is talking. We kind of get a bell curve based on who's around. So if you can shape that bell curve in a particular way towards views that you want them to move towards, people are naturally psychologically inclined to say, oh, well, I guess it's not that unreasonable to think this because oh, there's everybody else. Or they start to see their own normal view as somehow out of the mainstream. And people naturally will then shift towards that new mean. I always think of it as a statistical term, but they'll do kind of a shift. Uh, that's essentially what a civil attack is. Civil attack as far, as far as press reporting is going, was very much used by the Russians during the election, for instance, um, using automated techniques. Uh, Third-party authentication, dumpster diving, it is what it sounds like, you know, going through some of these trash. Uh, automated techniques, I kind of just spoke of uh, that. Uh, phishing emails, shoulder surfing, like I need somebody's password, you know, the, whatever they're, I'm not going to steal their database file, they employ, you know, great hashing and salting and everything else. They stretch the passwords and everything else. I'm never going to be able to guess it. I'll just stand over the guy's shoulder and figure it out after two or three times and I'll probably figure that out, right? Shoulder surfing. It's a part of social engineering. Okay. Um, we've got other types of social engineering. Use of pop-up windows. Yeah. Dumpster diving. I mentioned that. Um, utilizing someone's vacant computer terminal. Um, attacks that take advantage of social media and other publicly available information. People put so much out there, right? Non-phishing technical attacks that don't involve a human-to-human -human interaction. Despite this multiplicity, there are merely, these are merely variations of the core theme introduced at the very beginning. Social engineering requires that a victim stands in an asymmetric knowledge relation to the attacker, who uses that asymmetry to establish a technologic, technocratic dominance over the victim, typically through one or more of the techniques that we've just discussed. Finally, while maintaining this control, the attacker replaces the victim's behavior, behavioral purposes with his own, often altering the victim's behavior to suit the attacker's goals, or their thinking, and, and therefore their behavior, their voting patterns, whatever. The Podesta phishing attack illustrates this thing. The phishing email was crafted to look authentic, as I mentioned, and the hackers anticipated how Podesta and I team, the team might verify this, including as evidenced by its Ukraine timestamp and use of the HTTPS protocol, right? So it's an encrypted connection. Google's not going to use another type of protocol. Um, and the replication of Google's own wording, no doubt copied from legitimate Google warnings. The, these details place Podesta in an, a, an asymmetric epistemic relation to the attacker, who used this to establish control over his email account, copying thousands of emails and then releasing them through WikiLeaks, or giving them to WikiLeaks, which did what they did. The purpose for which Podesta created these documents and stored them in confidential, not the classification confidential, but in the normal sense, 
um, require, uh, uh, in a confidential account, stood at odds with these releases, which was the attacker's true goal. Other types of social engineering, thing, things like internal social engineering. This occurs when a sysadmin uses social engineering techniques on their own people, in their own uh, environment, uh, usually to try to do some sort of um, uh, a test of the robustness of their security. Another sophisticated social engineering attack is reverse social engineering, wherein an attacker, the, instead of an attacker initiating contact with the victim, the reverse occurs. The victim is tricked into initiating the contact themselves. This is particularly acute risk today, as the popularity and use of social network sites have, again, this is that normalizing, have uh, normalized the establishment of unsolicited contacts, right? We're so used to now getting unsolicited. I swear, my LinkedIn, like half the people there, I don't have any, I'm like, who are these people? Like, how did they get to my, but I'm afraid to delete them, because I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> They'll give me a job one day, you know? I don't know. Like, hey, Bill, remember me? Hey, guy. Um, so, uh, but un the establishment of unsolicited contacts, befriending distant acquaintances, and algorithms that prompt users to send and contact friend requests to complete strangers. Studies show that people are more, much more willing to contact and establish relationships in cyberspace with individuals uh, whom they would not contact absent a cyber medium. This online disinhibition effect, which is what Mary Aiken describes it as, uh, she's, she's a cyber psychologist, um, uh, effectively lowers the victim's guard, particularly if they're the ones who initiated the relationship, as in a reverse engineering situation. They think they went to, they didn't realize that they actually just clicked on the wrong place. One contact is initiated, well, sorry, once contact is initiated and trust is secured, the normal process of social engineering is set in motion. I mentioned the civil attack. Uh, there's also things, uh, something called a semantic attack. Social engineering attacks that seek to deceive rather than directly attack the victim through the manipulation of object characteristics. For example, a spoofed website or a URL that happens, that appears to be legitimate, but upon inspection ru uh, runs at an IP address and on a server not associated with this advertised content. This can be accomplished alongside DNS poisoning and other more traditional attacks. So you can basically get the, the internet phone book to send you to another place that looks just like your bank, but it, it isn't. Okay. Uh, and then finally, things like scareware, right, with, which alerts the victim that their computer has been infected by a virus and then op simultaneously offers to fix the problem by having him or her download an antivirus program, which is actually malicious software. Once the victim has cleaned the computer, I don't know why I'm doing this, I hate people do uh, <laughs> once, once people have uh, cleaned her, her computer, she remains unaware that their system has already been compromised or that a backdoor has been open by the malware for future access and attacks. Um, really, the variety of social engineering techniques are unlimited. It's, a, it's human imagination, right, how we can manipulate each other. Um, since, since it preys upon natu uh, natural social mores, institutions, and patterns of behavior that are parasitic upon these features of human society. Okay. Um, yet, yet, human societies do change over time, right? Uh, therefore, social engineering attacks will continue to parasitically evolve alongside its host, generating tactical varieties as it develops. The taxonomist attempting to create order amid this give and take becomes a modern Parmenides attempting to freeze a Heraclitian river. A little philosophy there. The dialectic between these two tendencies, the, the taxonom taxonomic taxonomic need for stasis against the fluidity of developing varieties of social engineering attacks sometimes gives the appearance of disagreement over the very meaning of the term. To choose but one example, many scholars, and I've got about 15 references here, many scholars take pains to associate social engineering with non-technicality. If it's a technical attack, it's not a social engineering attack in their lexicon. While others, another stack of people, uh, while others see no problem in including technical attacks that do not involve a large role for traditional human-to-human -human social engineering. In light of such disagreements, it is also interesting to note that social engineering, which was placed in quotation marks by John Gray when he coined the term in 1845, is still so placed by some scholars today. Others go further adding so-called social engineering, and others further yet seeking refuge in the ambiguities of metaphor. 
by emphasizing epistemic asymmetry, techno technocratic dominance, and teleological replacement <laughs> as the core that undergirds social engineering from politics all the way to cybersecurity, such tensions are easily avoided. And then my last point is social engineering, that's another good video, but social engineering comes full circle. So we're going to move back into the social political realm. Um, researchers, there are some new researchers who discuss an example where the migration of the universities and college admission service, this is the, uh, over in the UK, the way they apply for colleges, uh, from the United Kingdom to the United States was under consideration, necessitate, necessitating the software, this, this UCAS software's ability to cope with the peculiarities of US college applications, admissions, and housing accommodations in a discussion over whether to adopt the housing accommodation planning software called PAMS, P-A-M-S, they note that, quote, social engineering software was proposed to best align UCAS PAMS to the U.S. market. In this context, social engineering falls somewhere between the ability to create a social plan and the allocation of human movement via this software. This comes quite close to splitting the difference between the political and cybersecurity uses of the term, although I wouldn't say cybersecurity in this context. It's more of just a cyber operation, I guess I would say. Other, well, I guess if you were being manipulated in that way, you know, if your roommate turned out to be, you know, 001110 rather than Amy or whoever it was, uh, then maybe you might feel manipulated. But, uh, okay, sort of an ASCII table joke there. But uh, other, other scholars using social engineering to categorize attempts to discourage free riding and person-to-person -person, uh, networks, file sharing systems, not through the use of centralized planning, uh, centralized social planners, but rather through automated innovation such as overlay adap adaptation schemes that bring contributing peers closer together on the logical topology, thereby pushing free riders away from the contributors, from other, from uh, contributors. Additionally, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, systems can allow parallel upload-download, thereby creating automatic feedback loop, incentivizing contribution and creating disincentives for free riding.